Hi there, and welcome back to the next season, the summer season of the Perpetual Wealth Strategy podcast. I'm Patrick Donahoe, and I'm really excited about the next few episodes because we're going to get into the hierarchy of wealth. You know, the hierarchy of wealth was something that, you know, it was the result of me asking the question, what's something, what's a simple way to assess an asset? Because for some people, an asset is really risky, but that same asset could be a really safe asset for somebody else. So that's really where the hierarchy of wealth came from. And since then, we've been able to use it as really the foundation of Paradigm Life and how we help clients to uh, assess their assets, uh, their balance sheet, and, and understand what they should invest more into and invest less into. It quickly became that foundation and you know it really helps clients structure their wealth to build a solid financial foundation, ultimately earn an income for life, and then pass on generational wealth. My guest today is a good friend of mine. His name is Will Street. He's one of the wealth strategists here at Paradigm Life. And together, we're going to outline the hierarchy of wealth and then really focus on tier one assets, that foundational tier, which ultimately makes up a large portion of your overall finances. If you listen to only one podcast this summer, I, I, I guarantee that this one is going to be really beneficial to you. Uh, Will and I are, are really passionate about just the overall idea and how this has helped us uh, as well as multiple clients. And we're excited to have you join us. So welcome to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy Podcast. Hi, everyone. Patrick here. Thank you uh, for tuning in. I'm with a good friend of mine, one of the wealth strategists here at Paradigm Life, Will Street. Will, why don't you take a second and uh, introduce yourself before we get going? You're no, you're no stranger to the podcast, but hey, for those that may have not heard you before, let's, yeah. uh, let's give an overview. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I love uh, being on the podcast and especially these. I love this series that we do and the topics that we cover. So I've been on, on a few. Um, let's see, I've been here at Paradigm since uh, uh, March 1st of 2014. I'll always remember because it, it was March 1st. So uh, a little over six years, which is, uh, which is pretty incredible uh, because I've now been here at Paradigm for as long as I was practicing law at the firm that I was with before. So I was in my sixth and partnership year uh, at the firm that I was with uh, when I chose to step away and to join the team at Paradigm. And uh, so I've been here ever since. So that's, that's kind of crazy. As I'm explaining that now, I'm realizing I've been here for as long as I was there, which is, uh, which is pretty crazy. And life so, has never been the same. Oh, never been the same. Paradigm <laughs> will forever be a better place. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it's awesome. I love what we do and, and uh, just super passionate about it. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Let's dive into our, our topic. We, we felt that this would be really good to address now, given what's going on in the economy. At the same time, these are, these are times that can be identified in the past. Uh, and you, know, you look at the typical financial planning approach to uh, managing wealth, and there, I, I believe, was a, an int intention to create some diversification because markets would be volatile, things would change. And so having, you know, essentially different classes, uh, different uh, asset classes, different, you know, industries, different sectors, uh, even different countries, right, they, they play a role in that diversification. But we started to see, you know, especially right now, given what's going on, there's a, a correlation, right, where you have that type of risk associated with market volatility, where even though it may be a different asset class that may be you know, a different industry. There are, you know, variables that regardless of success, regardless of failure, you know, the equities typically, and as well as other securities tend to go in, in similar waves and direction. So we felt, you know, it was important to highlight how we look at risk, how we look at diversification. And it's a little bit different than how uh, most financial advisors uh, manage risk and help clients to analyze and then manage uh, manage risk. But I think it's a very important kind of fundamental thing to, to talk to because with the hierarchy of wealth, for us, we wanted to make it simple. We wanted to make it easy for a person to understand. At the same time, we realized that every person isn't the same. And so we wanted to also have it so that it's uh, not so uh, objective. It's subjective, right, depending on the, the individual. So maybe you speak to how you have maybe used the hierarchy of wealth 
and uh, its relevance in you know how you do advice and strategy with clients, and then we'll get into kind of the background and how we uh, came up with the idea. Sure. Yeah, so I, mean, I think you touched on an important point, uh, right? Where you know, if you talk to the average person, e- even even somebody who says, "Oh, I'm I'm diversified, I'm 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 good," you know, everything's I, I've got it all, I've got it all figured out, you know. And as you peel back the layers a little bit, diversification to them means uh, they've got some utility stocks, they've got some uh, telecom stocks, they've got some tech stocks, they've got some you know foreign you know, th- that type of thing. But at the end of the day, they're all equities, right? And so if the market's absolutely getting hammered, everything's getting hammered, right? It doesn't matter. In other words, true diversification means diversification across asset classes, meaning outside of the equity space. And so for us, when we talk about, uh, you know, a financial foundation, or we talk about tier one capital, um, really what we're talking about there in, in terms of the hierarchy of wealth, that's that foundational layer. That layer is not correlated to the market, right? So in other words, that's the capital. That's, that's that pool of capital that you have where even if you've got some equities and the equities are getting hammered, you know that that foundational layer, that tier one capital in that, in that, in that lowest, most basic space is not getting hammered. They're, it's not impacted in any way, shape, or form by the volatility that the market experiences. And that's where just, you know, I think in our experience as we meet with people who are just learning about us and what we do for the first time, there's kind of this false perception that they're diversified when in reality, we go through an experience like we've gone through and they realize, man, I'm not diversified. I need to do some things to clearly draw a line and create some separation between this capital and what the market's doing. And and that's a great explanation of of tier one. So let's un, let's unpack the genesis of the hierarchy of wealth because I think that's important so that individuals understand what we're talking about that may have not read the book or have uh, done business with us. I know the majority of people have that are that are listening to this. But the hierarchy of wealth really came about as the convergence of a few different ideas. The first being the you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where you know Maslow, a famous psychologist. And most people understand, you know, that that model because it's in pyramid form and it's pretty simple to understand. But you have foundational needs that must be met before you go into other types of needs. So you have these physiological needs, which is food, shelter, clothing, uh, survive, you know, survival needs. Then you know you get into uh, safety needs, then you get into relationship needs, then you get into uh, self-esteem needs, then you get into self-actualized uh, actualization needs. And these are kind of the, the sequence of steps people take when it comes to what they seek in life. And so we looked at that. And at the time, I was, I was studying and, and pretty intrigued with this, the order and sequence of things. But we were also uh, really heavily involved with the Rich Dad organization and uh, you know, getting into the, the Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, philosophy. And they talk about the idea of risk being a function of control and control being a function of financial education. So as we looked at really where tier one, which I would say is where you would have the most control, meaning you've had the most education around, uh, but then also it has, uh, you know, the least amount of risk. That's where you start to look for assets that perform the best, but also have the the track record, the history, uh, the certainty, so that it sits as like your foundation. Right. And then you progress to the second tier, then to the third tier, then to the fourth tier. And typically, you're able to classify assets not based on sector or risk profile, but based on control and control being a function of the level of education that you have. That's why it's somewhat subjective. But today, we're going to focus on that tier one, that foundational capital. And you hit on a couple of things that I wanted to emphasize. First, you hit on the fact that you know, there is a, there's an emotion and a feeling that comes from having something that possesses such a degree of certainty so that if there is volatility, whether it's market volatility or life volatility, sure. there are, you know, elements that you can count on that help you, I would say, emotionally navigate the, the rough waters, which are inevitable in, in life. And, and that's where we, you know, have categorized what we specialize in, which is the wealth maximization account, because it possesses certain characteristics that other assets simply don't possess. Number one, it's not correlated, right? But there's other features, benefits, whether it's the track record, the privacy that it has, the tax benefits that it has, 
uh, as well as the access through you know a policy policy loan uh, for the use of, of other things, whether it be lifestyle related or investment related. So maybe speak to the idea of tier one, where the tier like tier one comes from, sure. and uh, and also you know a few more of the benefits of using a wealth maximization account as that foundational asset. Sure. Yeah. So so tier one. That's a that's a term that exists, you know, beyond this space, right? You can, you know, organizations, corporate corporations, banks. Um, tier one capital is uh, is a term that's pretty commonly used, um, and it's used to describe, you know, that that pool of capital that is that exists as a buffer, right? That it's not, it, you know, it's not leveraged, it's not subject to, you know, tremendous amounts of risk and so on. It's designed to be this. Hey, we're, we're super liquid, and you should feel, you know, reassured and safe about, you know, investing with us or placing your money here. Right? That's a, that's kind of how the the general term is commonly used uh, externally. We obviously adopt kind of that same the use of that same term because just as a corporation can have tier one capital, right? It's rainy day fund and so on. And individually, we should adopt the same practice. We should have our own individualized, personalized tier one capital, right? So there's certain characteristics and qualities that that we want that tier one capital to possess. You know, you, you kind of rattled off several, you know, non-market correlated, um, you know, we obviously, you know, those who know a little bit more about us and know what the wealth maximization account is, they know that that's a, a, a life insurance policy that's designed primarily around the emphasis of the equity, right? The cash value in the policy. Um, we, we build using a mutual insurance company, which tends to be far more stable, has a track record that's far more lengthy than, uh, say, a stock-based insurance company. Um, because, again, if, if we're positioning our capital somewhere, we want it to be safe, but we also want it to be productive, right? We want it to earn a return, and that's where you plug into dividends and guaranteed growth and, and so on that you find with a, a mutual insurance company. So, just as a corporation or bank uses tier one capital to create uh, safety and security and to have a buffer against life, like you said, we're doing exactly the same thing in our own personal lives. And the wealth maximization account is ideally suited for that because of uh, you know, the fact that it, you earn guaranteed returns, you plug into a dividend that's been paid in many cases for 150 plus years. Um, it's non-market correlated, it's tax advantaged. Um, you know, in many cases, it's completely protected from creditors. Um, so there's so many just, you know, you could rattle off this list of desirable qualities to have in your sort of bulletproof pool of capital that you want as your foundational layer. And all of the boxes are checked in, uh, in the wealth maximization account. Uh, and so that's why it's, it's ideally suited for that base layer that we can then build on top of using the loan provision, which is yet another uh, feature that, that that it has that gives us the ability to do so many other things with. So I'll highlight just a, a couple of things from what you said. You know, if, if there was another asset out there that had what, you know, wealth maximization account has with a specifically structured life insurance policy with a mutual company, I mean, that's something that we would seek out and, and use. It. Yeah. Right. But it's looking at how mutuality works where, you know, you receive more or less a profit share from th- these really successful insurance companies, stable insurance companies. It, that you know it, it rivals uh, the returns of risk-based assets when you factor in you know lo- the long-term aspect of things as well as the tax tax benefits. Uh, but then you add on a, a lot of other things. And one yeah. of the one of the realizations you know I've had over over the years is that you know we all have these sh- kind of short-term short-term needs, whether it's uh, relating to our our family obligations that I don't think any parent really recognizes until they actually experience it. Uh, you know, both from like just the responsibility of raising children, uh, but then obviously the financial responsibility of uh, having to you know pay for braces and school and activities, and it seems to just get more and more expensive, and yeah. there's more and more of it. You know, I I look at you know short term whether it's that or whether it's you know maybe debt that's tied to school, uh, which is very uh, common these days. Uh, you also you know look at just maybe getting into the workplace or maybe transitioning from one career to, to the next. There's some short-term, I would say, emotionally driven aspects of life that I think the wealth maximization account is ideal for because there's liquidity, okay, there's flexibility, there's also the use of you know, policy loans and so forth uh, in which you can 
you know, obviously access with, you know, no, no penalty, which is not the same as other types of assets. But then you have, you know, the medium term of your life, right, which I think relates more to, you know, what we value as our the, the desired lifestyle, us being able to use, you know, policy loan as opposed to, you know, a credit card or a home equity line of credit, which may have higher interest rates. But then also it may apply to your business or apply to uh, enhancing your career uh, or again, going to, to family. I think there's some long-term aspects as well, which it really is hard to convey those long-term benefits that are kind of built into the beginning because insurance is one of the ideal legacy assets so that as you're evaluating how to transfer an estate and the most efficient way to do that, it plays a role there. So it's not just the return, right? It's, it's yeah. the other elements and the different roles that this type of asset plays throughout the different uh, stages of, of, your, of your life. Would you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just the only thought that came to my mind was, uh, you know, you, you talk about, man, if, if we could find if we could find all of these qualities somewhere else, you know, outside of an insurance policy, man, we'd, we'd explore that. We'd use that. And in many ways, I just kind of chuckle to myself because I don't know how many times I've said to clients, I almost wish there was something else other than an insurance policy because of all the misinformation and inaccuracies and misperceptions and stereotypes and stigmas that exist about insurance. If you didn't have to overcome some of that stuff and correct a lot of those things and say, and what, you know, what so-and-so has said about this is just not accurate, right? We're kind of having to correct and, and, and change perceptions. And that's a battle that you kind of have to fight. But the reality is, and in terms of all of the various, you know, the combination of these, of these different uh, elements that the policy possesses, you just don't find it anywhere else. Um, as much as we might, you know, wish for it to be somewhere other than insurance policy. That's just not, just not how it is. It's uh, now there's a, yeah. And there's, and there's other types of insurance policies that are out there, right? They, sure. Good point. they have cash value, but they're more geared to, to investment and growth. Yep. And, and that's where we kind of draw the line because we understand that there's some value to those types of uh, those types of policies at the same time, they don't have the same characteristics. And that's where the marginal, like the potentially marginal difference in overall return doesn't doesn't justify all the other you know aspects of what that degree of certainty does, and that's where you also look at if you know the role of another type of growth related insurance policy, whether it's an indexed universal life policy or a variable universal life policy, they play roles of growth and investment, which is you know the tier two, tier three, tier tier four assets potentially. At the same time, the amount of return that those types of vehicles get. Uh, it's not justifiable for the risk you take by not getting, you know, the underlying guarantees as well as dividends from the overall success of the insurance company that a tier one, you know, whole life uh, policy prov uh, provides. And that's where tier two investments, you know, this is not something, you know, a, a wealth maximization account is not something that we advocate as your sole asset. Okay? We advocate it as a, a primary foundational asset, a financial foundation but not necessarily the exclusive asset that you use. We advocate other investments, other, uh, other assets. At the same time, this essentially is that first domino. The second domino is being able to, you know, either use a policy loan to acquire other types of assets okay, or use other savings to acquire, acquire those assets. So I know that today we're just focusing on that, you know, that tier one, uh, but you know, what other elements go into establishing that, right? Because everyone comes to us with a different financial situation. Some have, you know, just a, a ton of cash and really good income. Some come to us that, you know, have uh, debts, they have maybe not much emergency savings, but maybe a really big retirement account. Like what are what are some kind of uh, standard uh, practices that do you use to, you know, identify what is this, the proper sequence of establishing this foundation. Sure, yeah, and I think you you touched on it uh, right right there uh, as you were asking the question. I think just from my observation, the the average person, and I would put myself in this category, you know, pre paradigm, just before I you know had knowledge, you know, before I knew better, the average person really doesn't have nearly as much tier one capital as they should, right? And and maybe to use common vernacular, maybe it's what I mean by tier one capital is emergency savings, right? A buffer against the loss of your income, um, a buffer against, you know, just various financial emergencies, your car breaks down, your, you know, home repairs, um, your, your child needs braces, you know, those types of things. The average person doesn't have 
the buffer to be able to account for those uh, those financial uh, issues that come up. And so the result is they tend to lean on a credit card and then they've got consumer debt that starts to build up. So in terms of the proper sequence, um, my when I having this conversation around hierarchy of wealth, this is probably this is one of the first conversations that I'll have with a client who's just starting to kind of learn about us because that's where you really start to dig in again to that foundational piece where so many people want to immediately jump into like a tier three or tier four because they can't wait to invest. And what you have to kind of, you know, kind of, you know, temper the, the emotion a little bit and say, well, how's your, how's your emergency fund? You know, if you were to lose your job, well, number one, how secure do you, do you feel that your income is? And if that income were to go away, how long could you sustain yourself without that income? And most people, when you start to kind of peel back those layers, the kind of Maslow's hierarchy kicks in and they're like, oh man, I, it would be rough fact, you know, for us and our family. And so in terms of proper, proper sequence, I think that emergency, uh, that long-term savings, uh, having an adequate buffer built up is huge, you know, starting with that. And then as that, as that pool of capital reaches certain thresholds and you start to get through that, then starting to look at that as uh, as an opportunity fund that you can then scale into, into other you know investment opportunities like real estate or business or or that sort of thing. So I think starting with um, emergency you know buffer against chaos you know life. Uh, I think that's that's number one. Uh, and then also you know we we talk to plenty of clients who have some debt and they say man I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around. Uh, you know, how does it make any sense if I'm investing over here, but I'm paying, you know, 20% on my credit cards? I'm, you know, that's a losing proposition right there. How do, but I don't know quite the, the, the time frame in which or the sequence in which to dig myself out of that consumer debt. Well, that, that's the beauty, again, of that tier one capital is whether it's building the emergency fund, whether it's eliminating personal debt, or whether it's, doing both of those and starting to kind of scale into other types of uh, investment opportunities like real estate or owning a business or so on. That's the beauty of, of the policy is regardless of who you are, that can be tailored to the individual. And the sequence in which those things happen is really specific to the individual. So regardless of where you are, that's the beauty of having that tier one asset is that can be adjusted and you can pivot and, uh, and, and tackle those various needs uh, all along the way in the proper sequence. You know, there's one of the things that I, I feel is, is important to, to point out with when it comes to debt. I mean, I, I think debt has become kind of a, a necessity for people as far as using that to, uh, you know, be a part of their lifestyle, right? Because sometimes income doesn't come in the right way or are there some need for supplemental this or that? And because people are, are mostly taught to put money away into something that is not liquid, it kind of puts them in the position of having to use debt. What's awesome about using the wealth maximization account is as you start to pay off debt, but also establish this foundational asset, you are able to position yourself so you're not going to have to use that type of debt in the future. Okay? Right. Because the policy loan can act, as I was saying a moment ago, it can act as that kind of pool of capital for your lifestyle expenses, whether it's going on vacation. Uh, buying a car, getting a second home, right? As opposed to having to use debt uh, through banks where sometimes you have control, sometimes you don't. Here is, you know, a really low interest rate, flexible loan that will always be available against your, against your savings. And that right there is, is powerful for people because for those that, you know, end up paying off all debt, well, now they can't like, do anything unless they save up again. Yeah. Right? yeah. Obviously using a, you know, the wealth maximization account allows you to do both at the same time. Right. All right. Well, let's maybe end with, uh, with, with a couple, with a couple things. Uh, you know, first, hopefully this give, has given everyone a, a good idea of what, you know, a tier one asset is uh, and the, and the role that it plays in a personal financial situation. But as we kind of transition to, to tier two, Will, you had said something about the, the opportunity fund. Yeah. Right. And, and right now, first off, hope, hopefully everyone can recognize that, you know, during volatile times, a, a emotions, you know, instinctively are on kind of high alert in a sense. And people have a, a lot of emotion as it relates to money these days. And so having savings, having, you know, dry powder and, and cash value that's protected from downside uh, loss and also uh, liquid to use 
you know, it's one of those, one of those times where the heightened levels of emotions are probably not the best time to, uh, to make investments on the positive side of things. However, when emotions are, you know, pretty much in that despondent, uh, you know, fear-based state, oftentimes that's one of the best times to make an investment. At the same time, it requires li liquidity. And that's what you had mentioned as an opportunity fund. So maybe unpack that just a, just a moment, because I think that'd be a great transition into the next episode where we get into tier two assets. Sure. Yeah. So I, I would say, again, just maybe generalizing a little bit, you know, people that we interact with or who come to us and let's say that, you know, the bulk of their capital is in a retirement account or, or something like that. Well, when the market's going well, people feel great about the fact that their money is sitting in a, in a retirement account, you know, 401k or something like that. Well, when the market's not going well, uh, that's when, you know, the, the, the anxiety levels really kind of go through the roof. Um, and I actually had a, a good friend of mine, one of my close friends uh, who I grew up with. Um, we've had some conversations just over the past couple of months where, you know, he's kind of experienced that volatility and just kind of the, you know, the uh, sort of nausea inducing roller coaster ride, you know, and watching your account values uh, go up and down within, within that retirement account. Well, there's not a lot of opportunity in that, right? You're, it's too late for you, right? You're, you've strapped into the roller coaster. The bar has come down. It's moving. You're riding the ride, right? There's no getting off. You're hearing the click, 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 click. And, uh, and I'm not a big fan of roller coasters, by the way. So it almost gives me a little bit of anxiety just imagining it. But the idea behind the policy would be, again, if, if you want to take some, some risk within the equity, you know, within equities, that's okay to do, right? But that's not, that's not tier one. And what, and, and what a lot of people kind of fall into is they start with, let's say, a, an equities position, like a retirement account or something like that. Yet they still have these, for some reason, these perceptions or these expectations that, but isn't that tier one capital? It, you know, I thought the market only went up, you know, kind of a thing. But that's, that's not, obviously that's not reality. And so you're riding that ride. And so you've got to let that capital just kind of do its thing, right? Especially if you're younger, there's not a whole lot of option there in terms of, you know, actively contributing to an employer-sponsored retirement account. You're kind of letting that thing do its, do its thing. But if you've got your if you've got your tier one base, all of a sudden now, when we're experiencing some of the maybe the turbulence that we're experiencing right now, right as with uncertainty and with turbulence and, and the things that we're going through, there's opportunity that comes along with that, right? Maybe that comes in the form of maybe it's real estate or or something like that or a business opportunity that if you had access to capital, you could acquire the property or you could you've got a great business idea that you could get off the ground, right? Having the tier one capital means that you have the opportunity, you use the term dry powder, right? You've got the ability and dry powder refers to the ability to, you know, get a gun loaded, get your musket loaded and to get a shot off, right? Where that, that dry powder is the capital that exists in your, in your wealth maximization account, that tier one capital that it's there, teed up, ready to go. And when the opportunity presents itself, you can move on that opportunity to take advantage of it. Whereas if you don't have that, your ability to take advantage of opportunities is dramatically limited because you're either having to dip into the cash that you had set aside for your you know, savings or something like that. But do you really feel good about depleting your emergency fund for that visit? Probably not, right? So having the tier one capital means that you've got your boxes checked, you've got your emergency fund positioned, that you've got the ability, you've got the green light to take advantage of opportunities when they come along because you did things in the proper order. And if you think, if you think about it, go back to the early, you know, COVID signs when <clears throat> we were being recommended to social distance, shut offices, shut businesses, don't go out. You know, there were really big companies, corporations that were like, uh, like I'm not going to make it, you yeah. know? And, and I think that really spawned the, the stimulus packages. But that was over just a couple of weeks, maybe a month. And what it has done, it's, you know, I would say temporarily put a Band-Aid over, you know, some pretty significant wounds uh, only to prolong the inevitable. And I look at, as you mentioned, whether it's, you know, homes, cars, businesses, you name it, 
right? When, when people don't have cash, that's when they have to start, you know, selling things off. Yep. Uh, and usually if they're in that position, they're not going to get market value. And that's why I, I think, you know, those that you know, understand the, you know, kind of asymmetric risk to war risk reward ratio, where, you know, you want to take little risks with have big upsides. This is where having, you know, a good opportunity fund uh, allows you to capitalize on these types of, of opportunities. Yeah. And sometimes they'll be tier two, sometimes they'll be tier three. Uh, but really now is the time to step back and, I, and start to identify when is a good time to act? When is a, a good opportunity uh, presented? And how do I assess that? How do I analyze that? And that's some of the stuff we're going to get into in tier three uh, or tier two, tier three and, uh, and tier four, because there's a lot of that, a lot of that coming at the same time, just as much as a lot of people got really good uh, deals on investments in 2010, 2011. I know a lot of people that made some really bad decisions as well. So it's not, you know, a bulletproof strategy just to say, oh, that thing's on sale, therefore I should buy it, right? There has to be a way in which you assess it. And I hope that the hierarchy of wealth is going to help you guys do that. Perfect. Yeah, I love it. Okay, Will, you've been, you've been amazing. Any, uh, any, any, final, any final words before we sign off and, uh, and, and call this first episode of our season two? Uh, no, the, the, maybe the only other thing that I'll mention, and, and this is something that I, I talk about pretty commonly with clients is, again, it's it, not to disparage the average person, right? Uh, because I think in a lot of ways, the average person is the average person because of limited information that they're exposed to, right? That's probably the saddest, most frustrating part about all this is the information that is disseminated in terms of what's you know a, a financially savvy thing to do can be so just spun and incorrect, right? I, and I think the beauty about the hierarchy of wealth is, and I've had clients say this to me, I don't know how many times, it's, it's a game plan, it's a strategy, right? The average person, when it comes to finances, I call it the buffet line approach, right? The, what dictates what you take a scoop of is a function of, well, where you entered the line and what happens to be in front of you, right? And you're, you may not be looking 20 feet down the buffet line, right? You're just taking a scoop of this, you're taking a scoop of that, but there's generally not a lot of thought given to, well, why did I take a scoop of that? And does that fit well on my plate next to that, right? In other words, there, there's not a lot of thought as to sequence, as to amounts relative to other amounts, right? So the beauty, in my opinion, of the hierarchy of wealth is it's telling us where to start. And, and what to start with. And then we've got just blue sky opportunity in terms of what we choose to build on top of that foundational layer, according to what we're interested in, according to what our objectives are, according to, you know, going back to your, uh, you know, this idea of, of control being a function of knowledge, what we know about, right? What we're familiar with. That's the beauty of the hierarchy is it's a game plan and it tells us the order in which we should take certain actions. Um, I think that's the most powerful part uh, of of all of it. it. It it eliminates the guesswork. Yeah. Well, I agree. And you know, obviously, this is just a, a podcast. Whether you're watching or listening to it, uh, but we do have a lot of resources we've created that will be uh, available on our website, uh, paradigmlife.net. And there's a whole section for our podcast. Uh, so there's you know some visuals there. We also have like an app that's in uh, in process, which. Uh, we'll help you do it even you know, more pinpointed, which will be out in the next several months. Uh, but listen, you guys have been awesome. Thank you so much for the support and hope you guys learned something from, uh, from this, uh, this topic. And make sure you uh, listen to the next one because we're going to get into some really cool stuff, to tier two, tier three, and tier four. Thanks again, Will, for being on. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, thanks uh, for joining us on this episode. It's, uh, again, the first of four that we're doing, dedicating all the focus to the hierarchy of wealth. Be sure to check out the podcast webpage, which is on paradigmlife.net. It's going to have show notes from this episode, as well as an infographic that explains the hierarchy of wealth visually. If you're ready to move on to Tier 2 Assets, all of these podcasts are available on demand, so you can check that out on the podcast player that you're in right now, or just go head over to paradigmlife.net, and on the podcast page, there is a player there too. Okay, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy Podcast. 
be sure to visit the show's official page at paradigmlife.net for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Guest opinions are their own. If you require specific investing, financial, legal, tax, or any other specialized advice, please consult an appropriate professional or a wealth strategist at Paradigm Life. We welcome and appreciate reviews of the show. Head on over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave your review today. And don't forget to subscribe to the show to get access to every new episode and its exclusive content. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time.